is the Will Kane Podcast on ESPN Radio. One of the hardest things to do in life, ladies and gentlemen, is to accept an unpleasant conclusion. One of the hardest things to do is to accept a reality that you simply wish were not so. The Cleveland Cavaliers are falling apart. The Cleveland Cavaliers are going nowhere. And the Cleveland Cavaliers, like so many of us, when faced with that reality, blame, make excuses, tell ourselves lies, do anything but face the honest, awful truth. The Cleveland Cavaliers are going nowhere, and the only real path forward with any sense of light, the only real path forward with any sense of the future is to trade LeBron James. It's the Will Kane Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. And it's time for Straight Talk. Brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. I understand how that lands. I understand what that sounds like. Oh my God, another hot take. Everybody says this. LeBron hater. Let me ask this one little simple request. Let's do this. Let's simply analyze this logically. Let's just do it with a sense of reality. Let's look at it with the full light of day shining on the situation, shining on reality as it exists. First of all, this is not normal. We had that debate a week ago. The Cleveland Cavaliers go through their January swoon. They go through their February swoon. Every winter, there's a new drama. We can go back and find tweets from 2015 or rough stretches in 2016. The argument coming from some like you, Steven Srudi, is this happens every year and this is normal. The reality is, and everyone willing to acknowledge reality, this is not normal. Yeah, this is definitely worse than it's been, but do I still, am I still worried that they won't make the finals or can't correct this issue? I'm not ready. I'm not sure I'm ready to go there yet. It's bad. It's very bad. And if you're unwilling to accept reality, you're dealing with a level of insanity. The there, there's, there's kind of two basic foundations of what the definition of insanity is. One is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And the other is an unwillingness to accept reality as it exists. The Cavaliers fail both tests of sanity. Number one, do you have an accurate view of reality? This is not normal. The Cleveland Cavaliers, as we went through last week, and I explained to you, are in a place they have not been in other years. They are a horrendous defense, one that ranks 29th in the NBA. Over the last, what is it, 10, 15-game stretch, the only team that they're better than has been the Sacramento Kings, and a good portion of that stretch, they're worse than the Kings. The worst defense in the NBA. And that has led to outcomes like what happened on Saturday night, where they gave up 148 points. To the Oklahoma City Thunder. 148. Former Cavs coach and roadside splatter of the guy who got thrown under the bus in the past for the Cavs woes, Dave Blatt, who's coaching in Turkey before an All-Star game, made this observation. I hope we don't give up as many points as the Cavaliers gave up last night. If you look at that box score, and apparently Dave Blatt did, it is an Oklahoma City Thunder Party. Party at LeBron's house. Free shots for everyone. Everyone had more than 25 points. Look at this. Paul George, 36.7 rebounds. Carmelo Anthony, 29 points, 10 rebounds. Russ Westbrook, 23 points, 20 assists, 9 rebounds. Steven Adams got in on the party. Party at LeBron's house? You bet there'll be a New Zealander there down in shots. 25 points, 10 rebounds. Everybody had a good time on Saturday night. Even Enos Cantor, who doesn't even play for the Thunder anymore, was taking shots on Twitter. Dave Blatt, Enos Cantor, everyone's pointing it out. And you know who else is pointing? The Cavaliers themselves. They're pointing at each other. According to a report last night from our own outside insider and all-star, Adrian Wojnarowski, said there was a team meeting. A team meeting among the Cleveland Cavaliers, the purpose of which was largely, apparently, to point fingers at each other. To point fingers primarily, it seems, at Kevin Love. He's the one that took most of the blame. Kevin Love was asked what happened during that meeting. Apparently, many members of the Cleveland Cavaliers felt like he faked an illness during that Thunder game. Tapped out early. Missed the rest of the game. Put his street clothes on and left. Love said, did I feel like a target? I think everybody, most people were a target. We're trying to figure this thing out. People hold themselves to a very high standard on this team, and we're a team that feels like we can compete at the highest levels. 
For us, it's not about me. I'm not going to make it about myself. I'm sure with the other guys, it's the same thing. Are you, Kevin? Because they seem to think it is about you. And you acknowledge that today. That's something that we're going to keep, or we try to keep in-house. I felt like we should keep it uh, on the court or in the locker room. Um, you know, obviously, it didn't stay there, but we just had a meeting. We aired any grievances we had, and you know we're going to move forward. Hopefully, we'll be better for it. We have been in the past, and you know we'll just uh, you know, put that behind us now, and we've got to face a tough San Antonio team tonight, so we've got to bring it on the road. Yeah, Kevin thought that was going to stay behind closed doors. He thought that meeting wasn't going to get out. Yeah, right. It did. Kevin was willing to take questions on it. LeBron, eh, so much. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. What's that, LeBron? What happened in that meeting? What happened in that players-only meeting? I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. All right. So I said the definition of sanity, Saruti, is twofold. Number one, can you acknowledge reality? The reality is this is not normal for the Cleveland Cavaliers. They are, quite simply, pulling apart. One could say falling apart. They are pointing fingers at each other. They're assessing blame. They're infighting. They're giving up records amount of points. They look nothing like a team that could win the East, quite honestly, much less the NBA Finals. And that leads me to my second definition of insanity. Do you do the same thing over and over expecting a different result? Man, we know how this thing's going to end. We know it. The Cavaliers are not, by anyone's estimation, going to beat the Golden State Warriors in the NBA Finals. That's the reality. Don't keep running into that wall. I think we all have this image of, you know, the underdog. In the play, Hamilton, I once told Greeny on Golick, or Mike and Mike, not to reference Hamilton, but there's a song that they play over and over, and George Washington sings, we're outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, and outplanned. You always think, well, that's the odds. That's how I like them, right? George Washington won. The Americans won. It happens in the movies. It doesn't happen in real life very often. That's why it's a heroic story. In real life, the story isn't like George Washington's. It's more like Custer's at Little Bighorn. Hey, man, you're outnumbered down there in the valley. You're outplanned, in fact. You don't even know that all these Indian tribes have come together to beat you. Down there in the valley, that's where the Golden State Warriors live. That's where the Golden State Warriors are ready to fight. You're going to charge down into that certain defeat again? That's what the Cavaliers are going to do? That kind of insanity over and over again? The reality is you're falling apart. The reality is you're not going to win the NBA Finals with this. And that leads you to the hard outcome. Then what's the best course of action to give you a future? To give you a future with something to build around. And the honest truth is, the only honest truth is, trade the remaining five months of LeBron James. I understand he has a no trade clause. I understand that it would not be something... It's not the ending that anybody wants for LeBron. But whether or not you analyze this from the city of Cleveland, the franchise of the Cleveland Cavaliers, or the future of LeBron James, that's the best course for everyone. It gives the Cavaliers a future. A future that might actually not have a ceiling. It gives LeBron an out from this mess. A mess that he largely created where everybody hates and blames each other. And it gives LeBron a chance to actually compete for a title. It is not a happy ending. But if you accept reality, it's the only path forward with any light. 888-729-3776, 888-SAY-ESPN. That's Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. Your calls, listen, I know it. no one wants to hear it. I know it sounds like you're just throwing... You come up with something better. You come up with a better path for the Cleveland Cavaliers. I, I I, challenge you. I dare you to try to come up with a better path forward for the Cleveland Cavaliers than one that doesn't involve trading LeBron James. It's the Will Kane Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. I know he has a no trade clause. I know it. Okay? The whole point is, not only is it best for the Cavaliers, not only is it best for the city of Cleveland, at this point, it's best for LeBron James. To accept a trade out of the insanity that is the Cleveland Cavaliers. Insanity defined as, A, an unwillingness to accept reality. You're not beating the Warriors. You're not doing it. Not with this infighting, finger-pointing, blaming, no-defending mess of a situation you're in. And the other B, the other definition of insanity, running into the same thing over and over again. 
the Warriors. You cannot beat them. If I gave you every trade proposal, by the way, it is the Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. If I gave you every trade scenario floating around right now, but here they are. If you go to Kevin Pelton, ESPN insider, he's got several trade proposals for the for the Cavaliers up right now. DeAndre Jordan, one. Lou Williams, Clipper, two. George Hill, three. Okay, let's just say, for the sake of argument, not that the Cavaliers could pull off one of those, but let's say the Cavaliers could pull off all of them, which they have none of the assets to do. But who cares? Let's, this is the point. It's a bigger fairy tale to tell yourself that the Cavs can beat the Warriors than it is to consider a future without LeBron James. So I'm going to grant you all the trades that are being considered, which the Cavaliers do not have the ammunition to pull off. All of them. You get DeAndre Jordan. You get Lou Williams. You get George Hill. Do you beat the Warriors? Does that team beat the Warriors? Hell, I'd even throw in Paul George, and I still don't think they beat the Warriors. <laughs> That's a pipe dream. Paul George changes the equation a little bit more. But I don't I don't think it does. I really don't. That's how bad it is. So what's more insane? That scenario, pulling off three trades, which you have no hope of pulling off to beat the Warriors, or considering that you might get LeBron to trade his no-wave clause so that he has a better chance to win a championship and you have a better chance of a future post-LeBron. All right, as I said a little bit earlier, LeBron, by the way, got an amazing note last night from one of the most famous people on Earth. On Instagram, he was congratulated for reaching 30,000 points, which he has not yet done, but he should tonight. And he got a note from LeBron James. Hit it, Bubba. Dear LeBron, want to be the first to congratulate you on this. <laughs> Let me get this straight. I want to be the first to congratulate you on this. This is from King James to LeBron James. I want to be the first to congratulate this on the, on this accomplishment achievement tonight that you'll reach. Only a handful has reached, seen it, too. And while it's never been a goal of yours from the beginning, try, please try. To take a moment for yourself on how you've done it. <laughs> I'm going to start drafting one of these to me. The house you're about to be a part of has only six seats in it as of now. But one more will be added and you should be very proud and honored to be invited inside. There's so many people to thank who has helped you to even make this possible. So thank them all. And when you finally, he's still using the second person. And when you finally get your moment alone to yourself, smile, look up to the higher skies and say thank you. So with that said, congratulations again, young king. One love. <laughs> Dear LeBron, love. You left out the hashtags. You left out the hashtags. Oh, I did. I should never forget the hashtags. Hashtag strive for greatness. Emoji rocket ship. Hashtag kid from Akron. Emoji king crown. <sighs> Dear LeBron, from LeBron, is, is this something we should look past? Srudy, am I being too harsh on this? This is so LeBron. Like he just does this, and I, I am the biggest LeBron defender in the world, and I cannot take his side on this stuff. He, he does this all the time. He tries really hard on Instagram. He posts those selfie videos of him at the gym, where like it's him walking around like singing a rap song. It's all really bad. And this is probably the worst thing he's ever done. God, he's so. F I, I, I have no hatred of LeBron James. I mostly have unbridled respect for LeBron James. By the way, when I say trade LeBron, it's not. It's, it's because it's the only logical course. You can't come up with a more logical course. But this right here, if this was written by Paul Pierce, who I'm a big fan of, I would be kicking Paul Pierce in the shins today, just like LeBron James. You can't write a letter to yourself. From yourself before you even make the accomplishment. Chris in Baltimore. What's up, Chris? Hey, what's going on, Bill, man? Uh, I'm hearing you take on the day, man. I was just telling my wife the other night, man. I was like, man, the best thing to is to trade the bra, man. Hey, Chris. Chris, I don't know if you got your window down or if you got me on speaker, but it's not working, buddy. It's not working, man. So what I'm going to do is replace you with another Chris. Chris from New Orleans. What's up, Chris? 
Hey, I just wanted to say, uh, well, first of all, how you doing, Will? I'm good, Chris. What you got? I think all the Cavs' problems are at LeBron's feet. He can't commit to the team, so they can't build for the present. They can't build for the future because he doesn't know what he wants to do. That's a fact. Thank Say, you. for instance, at, at the end of the season, if he doesn't commit to the team, if he goes and says he wants to sign a one-year deal, if I'm Dan Gill, but I say thanks, but no thanks. Thanks for the call, Chris. It's 100% true. The, the bottom line is the Cavs are in this situation because they don't know what their future looks like. The idea of trading LeBron is the only one that gives you a vision of the future. It's the only one moving forward with any sense of purpose. Everything else, you're just sitting waiting for actions to happen to you. By the way, if you're a Cavalier fan, I understand that you never want to lose LeBron James. But reality, once again, is accepting that it's probably going to happen. And Dan Gilbert is on record as saying, that's not going to happen again. We do not want LeBron to walk away leaving us empty-handed again. It's like, do you live a life of purpose or do you live a life as a reactionary? Letting things happen to you. This is the only purposeful pass forward. And the only way you avoid it is by putting your fingers in your ears, closing your eyes and going, no, 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 everything's going to be all right. This is normal. We have LeBron. We'll get it together. You'll get it together to do what? To do what? To possibly... Under a best case scenario, if you can get your defensive woes together, to lose to the Warriors again. That's your best case scenario. The worst case scenario is you snip and fight all the way through the playoffs and don't win the East. The Will Kane Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive's Home Insurance. Get your quote at Progressive.com today. While we're at it, while we're just wildly throwing around the trade machine, Someone brought this up today, and I thought it was pretty fascinating. What if I said, Philadelphia Eagles, you can have the first and fourth pick for Carson Wentz? What if the Cleveland Browns brought the house? What if they said, you can have it all, Philly? Just give us back the mistake of passing on Carson Wentz. Who laughs that trade off first? Who says no thanks and hangs up that phone first? Tell you what, why not just ask... Browns tackle Joe Thomas that in about five minutes. Straight ahead on the Will Kane Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. I mean, it's honestly easier to come up with a list of teams that wouldn't do this deal. So I'm standing around in the hallways of ESPN. Sometimes it is like the commercial that you see. A couple of Baseball Tonight producers are hanging out. And one of them turns to the other and says, let me just ask you this. Who laughs first? Who hangs up the phone first? Cleveland calls up Philadelphia. The Cleveland Browns call up the Philadelphia Eagles and say, have we got a deal for you? I will send you the first overall pick and the fourth overall pick for Carson Wentz. Who hits dial tone first? <laughs> Here's what I love about it. First of all, how much do you really love Nick Foles, Philly fans? <laughs> I've spent two weeks dealing with Nick Foles as a Super Bowl winning quarterback. I've, I've spent two weeks eating Nick Foles crow here. All right. How much do you love your man Nick Foles? That much? I mean, let's just play it out. You get your choice. Sam Darnold, Josh Allen, Josh Rosen. I mean, heck, if you like him, take Baker Mayfield. You can have Baker Mayfield. Some reports are indicating Deshaun Payton of the New Orleans Saints likes Baker Mayfield a lot. Maybe you will as well. And you get Saquon Barkley. How sold are you on Carson Wentz? Through do you think you know who laughs first? I can't... <laughs> This is ridiculous. I mean, I know Stu Goss was joking the other day saying, hey, now you got to trade once if you're the Eagles. The The Eagles hang up. Immediately. The Browns do that trade in a heartbeat. The Eagles hang up first. The funny thing about the Browns, the interesting thing about the Browns on that trade proposal is it's such egg on your face. It's such it's Doesn't such matter. an admission. Yeah, but it's such an admission. Last year we wouldn't use the – or two years ago we wouldn't use the number two pick on him, but now we'll give you the number one and four pick. But here's him. how you hide it. New GM. Wasn't our wasn't our guys. We didn't want to make that decision, and now you can basically undo because what they basically got two first round picks in in trading back. Now they're just giving up two, so they're they're breaking even, and they're getting Carson Wentz. How do you say you absolutely say yes to that? Okay, all right. So you're so convinced that the Philadelphia Eagles are the ones that laugh that off. Let me let me just ask you this: How many teams? How many teams would do this deal? Because I think the answer is almost everyone. Almost everyone would trade their starting quarterback for the number one and number four overall pick. It's harder to come up with teams that wouldn't do the deal. Would the Atlanta Falcons do it for Matt Ryan? No. no. 
they're one of the few that wouldn't. How about the Carolina Panthers? Would they trade Cam Newton for the one and four? Probably not. Probably not. I'm just coming up. I mean, obviously the Cardinals don't have anybody they would protect with that. What about the Steelers? I think the Steelers would do that. Too. I think they would too. <laughs> Roethlisberger toys with retirement every other day with them. They're living on a month to month basis. It's like paying rent monthly. You can't make any plans. You can't buy furniture. You don't know. Like, you can't ask your girlfriend to move in because you don't know if you're going to be there next month. No. I think the Steelers do that deal. I think the Bears do that deal. Don't tell me you're sold on Trubisky already enough to not come back with the one and four. No, sir. Uh, yeah, you know what? I, I I don't know if they would. I would do it. The Bengals would do it. I'm going to save the best. The Broncos would do it. Would the Lions do it? No. I think Stafford, Ryan, Newton. Those are protected. Packers wouldn't do it. How about this? Would the Colts do it? Yeah, probably. You don't have any idea what you have with luck anymore. And here's my favorite one. Before I would Bill Belichick do it? <laughs> Definitely. I think he, he wouldn't would be allowed sure. to do it. That's the problem. Yeah, we know he would. It's Robert Kraft wouldn't let him do it. Now here's the money. Would the Cowboys do it? Would they trade Dak Prescott for the one and four overall pick? Because if you're going to tell me absolutely the Cowboys would do it, in no way would the Philadelphia Eagles do it, I think you have an unhealthy view of what Carson Wentz is at this point. I've had the debate numerous times on this show. Dak versus Wentz. Dak versus Wentz. I was out there. Clearly it was a bad second half of the season for me to argue Dak over Wentz. I still believe that over the next five years, that's going to be a debate we have consistently. And I like my hand with Dak. I really do. I'm fully aware of his regression. I'm fully aware of how the second half of that season went. And don't bring me rookie seasons. You tried to bring this to me in the pre-show meeting. Dak's rookie season was record-setting. He had had a nice year. It blew Carson Wentz's out of the water. Carson Wentz had a decent start to that year. Kind of, kind of went down in the middle of the year. I see you've done some research since that argument. Yeah, but 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 then he had an MVP caliber season before getting hurt in his second year, and Dak regressed a lot. And I think Dak has way more help. I'm just saying, if you're not going to do the deal, if you're Philly, you got to give Dallas some similar sense of pause. Some similar sense of hesitation. It's hard to have this conversation with you because of how much a homer you are. You love Dak. You 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 are championing. Dak. Give me this. Would you take Dak right now over Wentz? Are you seriously telling me that? You you think? I think you still think Dak is a better quarterback than Wentz. Prospect. Can I check on that bet, Matt Matt Damon and Rounders? Can I check for a little bit? Can I see how this plays out for another? I mean, year you or were two? hard on one side before this year started. <laughs> well, I admit I've seen the evidence. I admit what's happened. By the way, Joe Thomas, Cleveland Browns star. One day Hall of Famer, left tackle was supposed to come in here and have this debate with us. What's he doing? Is he big time in us for what's what what's going on? And probably the- there was some confusion with his schedule. He's new here, obviously. He's he's you know he's coming through the hallways, hasn't been here a ton, so uh, I think timing was an issue. But we will have him. Did you see the Lebertard show making fun of his hair? It is a little weird. They made fun of Joe Thomas's hair. I think they accused him of both comb over and a mullet. Both. There's a lot going on in the back. I don't think that kind of slight should go unanswered. We're going to have to ask him about that. Let Pull that sound. Pull that sound so he can hear exactly what they said about him. Well, um, listen, I'm going to say this really quickly. Super excited about the way the show has gotten off the ground, launched. It's always fun. We're, we're going to be announcing this stuff in the future. We're already picking up affiliates. We're picking up some new markets. This thing is growing. <laughs> And if you're watching right now, I don't, I'll tell this to your face. It's awesome to get compliments from people you've idolized throughout your career. So Bill Simmons just tweeted and said he loves the first two segments of the Will Kane show. He may have been making fun of me. He may have not. I don't care. I don't care. I love it. And I, and as I'm on record of saying some things, I heard on the new Bill Simmons podcast that Tony Romo discussed his future in coaching, that he might consider a future in coaching. So is it so crazy what I said? Tony Romo? potentially being the coach of the Dallas Cowboys, that I would do away with Jason Garrett right now to bring Tony Romo into coach the Dallas Cowboys. Keep calling me crazy and keep watching the future play my way. Speaking of the Dallas Cowboys, Des Bryant, is he in the future of the Dallas Cowboys? Is he in their plans? T.O. says it's Jason Garrett's fault, not Des's fault. I'm going to tell you why, as much as I love him, the Dallas future may not include Des Bryant. It's the Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Thomas is going to join me at the top of the next hour. 
We'll ask him about his mullet, his comb over, and all the shots fired by the Lebetard Show. It's the Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Speaking of shots fired, there's either some brutal honesty or some real shots being fired in the city of Dallas. Stephen Jones went on the podcast, Hanging with the Boys on DallasCowboys.com. And Stephen Jones, honestly, he began to lay out a future that did not include Des Bryant for the Dallas Cowboys. Now, it may not say that in the words he said, but I'm going to tell you. You read between the lines, that's what's going on. Number one, he said, Des has been a distraction on the sideline. Number two, Des's production is not matching his his salary, the money he's making. And Stephen Jones is not Jerry Jones. Jerry Jones, for all his risk-taking, wildcatter, billionaire ways, shoots from the hip. He shoots from the hip in his business deals. He shoots from... The hip when he's talking. You can love it about him, you can hate him about it, and you'll probably do both. But what he says, you have to take with some grain of salt. But it's a grain of salt. But Stephen Jones, his son, much more calculating. In fact, listen to this. You can hear it in, hear it in his own words. This is what Stephen Jones had to say about Des Bryant. The Des, uh, you know, situation uh, has a lot of moving parts to it uh, when you look at it. Uh, Des is certainly. A fiery guy. Right, right. Uh, plays with a lot of emotion, both on and off the field. And uh, sometimes that can be a distraction. It can be a distraction for Dez. It can be a distraction for other teammates. And uh, we just have to, uh, you know, really get our hands around where, uh, when you put all the uh, the full body of work together, where that's headed. And, of course, uh, uh, we pay Dez a lot of money. And yes. He knows that. Uh, he's aware of it as anybody uh, when he talks to Jerry and myself. Right. and. You know, he knows when you get paid that kind of money, there's high expectations in terms of the productivity, as you mentioned. And so those are all things that we have to look at as a team, as an organization, when we uh, start to put our team together for next year. Man, that, that's Stephen Jones again on Hanging with the Boys podcast on DallasCowboys.com. I mean, that is laying the groundwork either for the Dallas Cowboys to move on from Des Bryant, and what I mean by that is cut him, or ask him to take a significant pay cut. Des Bryant currently makes... $12 million a year. His cap hit is $16 million. Let me just tell you where that puts him in wide receiver salary rankings. Antonio Brown is number one. He makes $17 million a year. DeAndre Hopkins, two, $16 million a year. A.J. Green, three, at $15 million a year. Then you have Devontae Adams, Julio Jones, Des Bryant, and Demarius Thomas all in a group together. Does Dez's production match that? Certainly not. And hasn't since 2014. The stretch he had from 12 to 14 with Tony Romo as his quarterback was incredible. It was top of the NFL type stuff. It was a dominating wide receiver in the NFL. I'm talking 80, 90 passes a year, 1,300 yards, 12 to 16 touchdowns. Three years in a row. But since then, through injuries and honestly a lack of chemistry with with Dak Prescott, it's cratered. 69 catches for 800 yards this year and six touchdowns. Now why? Why has Dez cratered? I'm going to give you the reasons. Number one, I don't buy a deterioration in his physical skills. I don't buy that he can't get separation. I don't buy that he can't catch. I've seen all the stats and I've peeled it back, you know, the layer below that. He he had an inordinate number of drops this year. But if you watched, you know that Dak, when Dak throws it to Dez, they are prayers or forces. They're not throwing it to an open guy. Now, maybe you say Dez doesn't get open, but the truth is Tony completed those passes to Dez Bryant. Tony Romo completed those back shoulder 50-50 jump balls to Dez Bryant. Dez Bryant fit Tony Romo. He doesn't fit Dak. Dak hits Cole Beasley, Jason Witten. Dak hits, honestly, receivers like the New England Patriots have. Dak benefits from receivers like Danny Amentola and Wes Welker and Julian Edelman. That's what Dak seems to work well with. Now, many say, Dez can't become that kind of receiver. He doesn't understand the route tree, can't be a flanker, can't be a slot receiver. He can only be on the outside against the boundary. And if that's the case, then the future for Dez Bryant in Dallas looks very, very bleak. Because you can't pay $12 million a year to a guy giving you 60 to 70 catches a year. And the truth of the matter is, should you anyway? I mean, I asked some of our research department to look this up this morning. I said, I just, I just want to see what the best teams in the NFL, what do they spend as a percentage of their cap on wide receiver? 
So let's start with the best team in the NFL, the New England Patriots. 12% of their cap they spend on wide receiver. That's guys like Danny Amendola, who was undrafted out of Texas Tech, cut by the Dallas Cowboys, didn't make it with the St. Louis, Los Angeles Rams. Ends up, if not Tom Brady the MVP, Danny Amendola the MVP of the AFC Championship game. You want to keep going? Philadelphia Eagles. They spend a good amount of money on Alshon Jeffrey, but they rank 25th in the league in how much they spend as a percentage of their cap on wide receiver. The Jacksonville Jaguars, 27th. New Orleans Saints, 28th. Even the Vikings and Falcons, middle of the pack, 14, 19. The Dallas Cowboys, where do they rank? Fourth. It's been the fourth most as a percentage of their cap on wide receiver. Now why? Why do that? Sir, do you point out an old friend of our show, Tommy Freeze Pops? He had a long-running theory. You don't need a receiver to win the Super Bowl. Yeah, his thing was that you don't draft, you shouldn't draft one very high in the first round, and that the last like 20 years worth of Super Bowl champions have not had a highly drafted, or have not drafted a wide receiver highly. But my, my counterpoint would be, all right, so what are you saying? You don't want Julio Jones in your team? Yeah, and you don't but, want Antonio Brown in your team? Well, like, I don't want to overpay for a guy who's past his prime, but I'm taking all those guys in my team any day of the week. But for a historical comeback by Tom Brady last year, exactly. Julio Jones would have disrupted that stat. But still, that's the exception, not the rule. I mean, if you're looking for ways to build your team, big, expensive, wide receivers should be towards the bottom of your priority list. Offensive line, defensive line. Start there. Then quarterback. Then fill in the further away you get from the ball. Then fill in receiver. Then fill in running back. I love Des Bryant, man. I love him. I don't buy the distractions thing. I don't care what he does on the sidelines. Michael Irvin did that. He's 88. Michael Irvin was 88. They both were physical receivers. I loved Michael Irvin. I love Des Bryant. I love his story. I love his rags to riches. Impossible success story. I'm just not sure it's the formula for success for the Dallas Cowboys anymore. It fits the image. It fits everything. But man, do I have New England Patriots envy. <laughs> At some point, the respect you have for them says, why don't we just follow a similar model? Why don't, more, why don't more teams follow the model? Don't hire the coach. Follow the model. Because it's impossible. Simplicity is Get impossible. Get your quarterback to take like half of what the market value is? Yeah, okay. That's Why doesn't everybody do that? But we've talked about it. What the Patriots do is so simple. Eh, we don't give the other team bulletin board material. Eh, we adjust at halftime. Eh, we like to take away the thing they do best. Simple. Don't shoot yourself in your own foot. Simple. Might, might just be something to emulate. The Wilkes Kane Show is reminding you you can watch all three hours of the show on ESPN News. So straight ahead, Joe Thomas is coming. All right, Joe Thomas in studio on the Will Kane Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. This is the Will Kane Podcast on ESPN Radio. Why is it always everyone else's fault but LeBron James? I'm just saying, Kevin always seemed to be Kevin Love's fault. He always seems to be the guy who's like, oh, you know what's the problem around here? Kevin Love. Isaiah just walked into the building and it's Isaiah's fault. Why is it everyone else's fault? Whatever's going on in Cleveland, we might look around for the source of the problems. It's the Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. I have one of Cleveland's own. In my studio today, it's Joe Thomas, Browns Tackle, in studio giving us the Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, no contracts. I just asked you, Joe, you have a record. What is it? 10,363 straight snaps. You got it. Did you write yourself a congratulatory note? Not at 10,360. I know I waited until I actually got the snap streak. Uh, no, that's pretty funny. I actually laughed out loud uh, when we heard that bit here just before the, this interview. Could you do it? Could you bring yourself to writing to yourself in second person? You know, it's funny. I can't wait to get off this interview and read what has actually <laughs> gone down. I've not seen it. You know, I've been in the car wash all day here at ESPN, so I didn't get uh, most of the good news that's out there. What do you, by the way, what are you doing? You're going to go into media? What's, most times when guys come up here, I, you know, they do the car wash and they hang out on different shows. You kind of wonder, is this what he wants to do in the future? Is this what Joe Thomas wants to do in the future? Uh, I don't know yet. That's the great question. Um, I'm not sure if I'm ready to retire or not. I'm sort of questioning if I want to come back for another year in the NFL and I'm just trying to stoke the fires, keep the doors open for whatever I decide to do when I am ready to retire. You want me to show you how it's done? 
Yeah, let's show me right now. I'm ready. Would the Browns give up the number one and the number four pick for Carson Wentz? Right now? I don't think so. I, I don't think you'd do that. You wouldn't from the Brown side. I, I don't think you'd do that right now. Um, it's totally fictional, clearly. Uh, but I, honestly, I think with that number one pick, there's another Carson Wentz in this draft. And I think you can get him, whether that's Josh Allen or whoever else you, you deem that before the draft. And then with number four, I think you can get another impact player. So I think you're better off down the line if you don't trade both those picks right now. Now, clearly, if you go into the draft and you're looking at all the quarterbacks and you're saying, I don't think there's a franchise guy here, well, then then it's a different analysis. And then you say, okay, we need to find that guy right now, so let's let's do the number one and number four for Carson Wentz. See that's Rudy? See that, everyone? Everyone said the Philly was the side that laughed that deal away. Philly was the <laughs> side that hung up the phone first. You're saying, no, 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 the Browns don't do that deal. I don't think they do it right now. Um, what is the best thing about being a Cleveland Brown? The best thing is the passionate fan base that you get to play for every Sunday. I think they're the only fan base in football that would show up at 0-15 for that last game of the season. They're the, they're the only fan base that would be so excited about 0-16 so they could have a parade to show how much they love their team and how much they care about it. Most most other markets, they're just going to turn the TV off. They're going to stop watching. They're going to stop paying attention. But the Cleveland Browns feel like family to the people in the city of Cleveland. You know, the only time in my life that I ever even toyed with the idea of sports bigamy, of having two teams <laughs> in my life, I grew up outside of Dallas. I was raised to be a Cowboy fan. I faithfully followed that credo. Cowboys all the way. But in the late 80s, you know, I'm like... I'm in like I'm like 12, 13 years old. Cowboys were pretty bad, mm -hmm. and the only team that I was willing to kind of flirt with was the Cleveland Browns. Oh. Bernie Kosar's number 19 jersey. Mm -hmm. I loved the colors, and I loved what you're talking about. Just the passion of the fandom, the dog pound, all that. I saw it, and so yeah, what I did is sign myself up just in time to experience the fumble and the drive <laughs> and all the stuff the Denver Broncos put the Cleveland Brown fan base through. A good timing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, when you look at the NFL today, you are, by most accounts, over the last decade or so, the best left tackle in the NFL. When you see other guys playing the game, who do you look at and go, you know what, that's that's a guy who I can learn something from, who's in the running with me? <sighs> who's in the current NFL right now? Or guys that were playing when I was a rookie? Well, I was going to say, who's right now? Right now? Uh, two tackles that I love to watch, Trent Williams, Tyron Smith. Um, both outstanding left tackles, both guys that have much more ability than I did. Um, I'm not sure I could learn anything from them just because a lot of their game is athleticism and they've got great technique. Don't get me wrong, but, uh, I think their level of skill, athleticism, power, strength, size was better than me. Um, and I was a little bit older than them. So maybe hopefully they learned a little bit from me when they were watching me. Um, but it's fun to watch the the passion and uh, the aggressiveness, the violence that those guys play with. I, I, I tell you what, I, I take that back. Trent Williams, when he was in Washington, we got Kyle Shanahan as our offensive coordinator. And so he brought all the film that he had when he was with Washington. And I did learn a lot about that offense from Trent Williams watching him when he was running Kyle Shanahan's office with the Redskins. Who keeps you up at night? The night before a game, who are you afraid of on the other side of the ball? Early on in my career, it was Dwight Freeney. It was DeMarcus Ware. Those were two guys that always made me nervous uh, right up until the snap. And did you figure them both out? I wouldn't say you ever figure those guys out, but I feel like I had a pretty good game plan going in, and I felt like I held my own against those guys. I feel like um, I did as well as I could have during those games. Um. I brought up Cleveland. You are a Cleveland guy. Whatever's going on in Cleveland right now with the Cavaliers, there's guys finger pointing during a meeting. Mm -hmm. There's guys sharing blame. It's clearly whatever's going on with the Cavaliers seems to be somewhat different than in the past. What do you think is going on with the Cleveland Cavaliers? Well, like you mentioned earlier, you got to have a fall guy, right? So that's, that's Kevin Love. I'm glad he's still around to be the fall guy. But if you look at LeBron through the history of his career, he's actually played better. His teams have played better when there is that controversy surrounding. There is those distractions swirling around their team. Um, they're a lot like the Patriots, actually. You look at the Patriots. When do they play the best? When they circle the wagons, when everybody's talking about the team falling apart, Brady's getting too old, 
those are the times when those guys are excelling. And the way I see LeBron and the teams that he's been on, he always seems to excel, and those guys play the best when everyone's doubting them and when everyone's talking about all the problems that are going on in their locker room. This seems to be like the airing of grievances week. <laughs> From like Kawhi in San Antonio, who's having problems apparently and might not even want to remain a San Antonio Spur, to whatever's going on with the Cavaliers. And then we just, I think, was it a week ago, we're talking about what's going on in New England between Belichick and Kraft and Brady. Do you buy any of that, the stuff that's going on in New England? Well, I've heard whispers for years and years that Brady and Belichick didn't really like each other, but it doesn't really matter if they like each other or not. Um, they obviously work very well together. They may not enjoy each other's company, but they get the best out of each other. And so I don't really know if it matters. You know, honestly, I think it's that controversy and that, that constant, uh, alpha male back and forth that they have in that locker room. And in those meeting rooms that I think bring out the best competitor in both of them. What NFL coach has gotten the best out of you, brought out the best in you? I would say probably Hugh Jackson. You have you know, to my say last, Hugh Jackson, my last couple of years in Cleveland. <laughs> if I take Hugh yeah. out because you have yeah. to say Hugh, then yeah. Who? Uh, probably Kyle Shanahan, um, with Mike Pettin. Mike Pettin was the head coach, Kyle Shanahan, offensive coordinator. I think Kyle's offense probably catered to my skills, my skill set the best out of any offense that I've been in. Um, and he was a great motivator. He was not a rah-rah guy, which is not who I am. A lot of offensive linemen, we don't like rah-rah. We don't like the motivational speeches. We don't like watching the videos. We just want to talk ball and talk about how we can get better. And Kyle was as good at as anybody at talking X's and O's, pumping you up, making you feel really good going into those games. Wait, so how's he a motivator if he's not a big rah-rah guy? What does he say to motivate because, you? Because he's boosting you up showing film about you dominating your opponent, talking about how great you did on this play and how it's going to transition to what you're going to be doing on Sunday. It was it was that sort of a speech rather than showing the lion attacking the gazelle in Africa. <laughs> oh, wait, I forgot. I have to ask you this. Did you hear about this? The Dan Probably Levitard not. show talked about you today. You said you've been doing the car wash. Yeah, I'm yeah. Gonna, listen to this. I'm, yeah. We're going to play it over. Oh, I'm going to let you respond. Tremendous. Listen. One of my Hold favorites. On a second. Someone tell Joe Thomas that his hair is a disaster on first take. Whoa! Someone tell him he's got party in the in the back, uh, comb over in the front. Somebody tell Joe Thomas that he needs hair help on first take, please. He looks like his mom just licked her hand and and slicked his head his hair back on the yeah, first day of yeah, school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I'm going for the Barry Melrose look. It's a little bit. Yeah, I but appreciate it. When you see him around, you realize the Barry Melrose look is extreme. So you got some ways to go, especially in the back. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. You know, it takes a while for the hair to grow. The mullet doesn't just show up overnight. Give you don't back. just roll out of bed with a mullet. Give it back to Levitar. Don't take that. He's got yeah. plenty of things you can poke at. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that he'll have me on his show tomorrow and I can really crush him, you know, man to man. It would be perfect. All right. Well, thanks for coming on my show, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, coming up, I said the best option for the Cavs and LeBron is to actually trade the King, to trade LeBron. It's best for both of them. What does Brian Windhorst think? I'll ask him next on the Will Kane Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Join the crowd, Brian Windhorst. I have a feeling you're going to hate me by the end of this segment. Brian Windhorst on the Shell Pinzo Performance Line. Get the feeling of being rewarded with gold status at Shell with the Fuel Rewards program. Download the Fuel Rewards app. Join and start saving five cents a gallon today. What's up, Brian? I'm not going to hate you. You're playing Tom Petty. <laughs> well, let me do my best, okay? I'll try. How in the world is it Kevin Love's fault? How in the world is it Isaiah Thomas's fault? On one hand, every year it seems to be Kevin Love's fault about what's going on in Cleveland. And now, add to the usual kicking dummy Kevin Love, it's the newest guy in the building. It's Isaiah's fault. That's who everybody's pissed at in Cleveland. I just can't make sense of how these are your two problems. Well, Kevin Love has been a professional since day one. He has been uh, belittled. He has been called out on social media. He, you know, last summer he was heavily out there in trade talks. Didn't complain about it publicly. Came to training camp day one. Um, is probably, you know, has a, a good chance, in my opinion, to be named an All Star tonight. Um, he's, he's seen his touches diminish dramatically since Isaiah got there. Again, publicly, not a word. Um, you know, okay, maybe he was a little premature or didn't go through a protocol or whatever uh, on Saturday and left the game. Uh, I don't see why it's a federal case, but, you know, whatever happens yesterday, here comes Kevin out today. LeBron says, I don't want to talk about it. Kevin 
puts a good face on it, says hopefully it'll be a positive. He's been nothing but professional. He's a poor defensive player. He's never been a good defensive player. He never will be a defensive player. He's part of the Cavs' defensive problems. But to me, he has handled this like a pro. And earlier this season, Derrick Rose, you know, look, whatever happened, happened. He left the team for two or three weeks for a mental health break. He was welcomed back with open arms by everybody on the team, including uh, LeBron James. Kevin Love leaves early because he's sick, and all of a sudden he's being treated this way. It's very surprising, and obviously there's a lot deeper issues going on than that. Yeah, if I'm Kevin Bryan, I'd want out. I mean, he's you and I talked. We talked last week. The idea that they're going to trade the Brooklyn pick, the number one pick from Brooklyn, that's just that, mor- that mortgages their future. And honestly, I don't even know what it brings back that helps them defeat the Golden State Warriors. That means Kevin becomes their biggest trade piece, I would think. Um, And if I'm Kevin, I'm ready because I'm tired of being your kicking dummy. Well, I'll put it this way. I would be interested to find out uh, what he said to his agent, Jeff Schwartz, who's one of the most powerful agents in the league after this meeting yesterday. Uh, Certainly, um, you know, you would not blame him if he felt that way. That said, I have not, me personally, I have not heard one word about him on the trade market, nor have I heard any sort of demand or anything like that. Uh, He has been a professional. He hasn't always been the best player. He's sometimes been, you could accuse him of being soft. You could sometimes accuse him of being a wallflower, but he's been a professional all the way through this. But you did say, I believe, that Isaiah Thomas is a potential trade chip already into his Cavaliers tenure. Is that right? I do believe that everything's on the table right now. Um, Isaiah has not you know, it's not a personality thing. I don't think it's anybody dislikes him. His game is rubbing his teammates a little bit raw right now. Um, he holds the ball a lot longer than they're used to. Um, and he, you know, that's who, that's who he is. It's, it's not like he's trying to hurt him. His game is give me the ball, let me create, let me dribble, let me probe and find my way, let me get to the foul line. And when he's shooting 45% and he's averaging 28 points a game and he's not playing with other all-stars like he did in Boston last year, that can work. In Cleveland, especially as he's coming back from injury, it has caused the Cavs to really struggle. Uh, Their offense has been terrible when he's gotten the game. Uh, Players are openly complaining on the court, on the bench, about Isaiah holding the ball. And their defense is awful because he is not a good defensive player. It is not a good situation. And at the end of the day, he is, he has some trade value because he's an expiring contract. And with the Cavs looking at everything, I believe one of their options is to move him. Who's openly complaining on the bench? I'm not going to say that. I just know that it happened. Oh, I thought it was open. That's why I asked. <laughs> um, fair, fair. Let's put it this way. If you if you want to have fun tonight, no matter what the score of the game is, just keep an eye on the benches in that Cavs-Spurs game. Cavs-Spurs tonight. I will be watching, and I'll be watching for that. Brian Windhorst on the Shell Pinzo performance line. I think this is the part where you get mad at me, Brian, but so be it. You talked about the few chips that they have. We talked about Kevin Love, talked about Isaiah Thomas. Here's the thing, and this isn't coming from a hot take, and this isn't coming from hatred of LeBron. Tell me where my logic fails, because I know you agree with me on a couple of these steps. The Cleveland Cavaliers are not going to beat the Golden State Warriors as constructed. That is reality. They don't really have a trade scenario where they can improve enough to beat the Golden State Warriors. That is a reality. LeBron James has a no-trade clause, but the best path forward that I can find that gives the city of Cleveland, the franchise of the Cleveland Cavaliers, and LeBron James as an individual, all of the things that they need, meaning LeBron a chance to compete for championships, and Cleveland with a path forward, a purposeful future, is for the two to part ways. LeBron becomes the trade chip that actually gets everybody an outcome that they want beyond the non-storybook ending. Now kill me. Okay, so, I mean, uh, from, if this was a, just a straight, non-emotional business situation or a laboratory, you would go to LeBron James if you were the Cavs and you would say, uh, are you going to commit to us past this year? And he's going to say, I'm not going to commit to anything. I'm not going to commit to dinner tomorrow night. And then you would say, okay, then we need to trade you and we're going to try to work with you to find a destination. That's what you would do if this didn't have emotions in it. Right. But it does have emotions in it. The other thing is... Um, there's still a decent chance that they can retain LeBron. And if they um, can go through the end of the season and figure out a way to do it, I don't think this is a time to pull the ripcord on it because he is a non-renewable resource. Once he walks out the door, the franchise may never have a player like that ever again, or it may be 50 years. Right. So, you know, your point you're making 
if we were in an academic setting, there is there, there is some reason for that. Now, I don't think he would have much trade value, quite frankly, because uh, he control he could control the trade, and he wouldn't want a team trading away all of its assets uh, for him. And also, the team would have to be convinced he would resign, which he's not going to give the commitment to. So, I don't know how feasible it would be, even if this would happen. But I also think if you're the Cavs, you pull out every stop, you you you, you know go every byway, every forward every stream, climb every mountain to, until you know it's totally over because um, that's the way you have to play it in the situation. Okay, I appreciate the rebuttal, that it was sort of academic, it's theoretical, it's in the laboratory, but emotions play in real life. So I've only got like a minute, but I want to ask, I have to ask you this. I'm not sure it is totally academic. I'm just going to put this to you. Dan Gilbert did say he doesn't want to find himself in the situation he found himself during the decision ever again. Do you think Dan Gilbert would sit here like we have done today and theoretically try to figure out if I can't get a commitment from LeBron, i got to find a way to capitalize. I think the time for that was last summer, and I think Dan Gilbert is already employing that logic by trading Kyrie Irving for a draft pick, which is one of the things that has frustrated LeBron, but is a consequence of him not committing. Okay. You're great, Brian. I appreciate having you on the show, man. Thanks, Will. All right, Brian Windhorst on the Shell Pinsel Performance Line. All right, straight ahead. Brian just brought it up. What is LeBron's trade value? Five months of LeBron James. What does that bring you back? Does that give Cleveland light? Plus, in the airing of Grievances Day, another NBA star doesn't seem to be too happy with the team that he's on. It's the Will Kane Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Well, that's a pretty good deal for the Cavs. Channing Fry and a mom Shumpert that brings back George Hill. You just heard Kevin Winter on the Sports Center update mention that as a potential trade being bandied about for the Cleveland Cavaliers. It doesn't help solve their woes. In fact, I don't even think it goes very far. It's the Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio on the ESPN app. George Hill solves one of their problems. Defense on the perimeter. Defense at the point of attack. Defense from the point guard. That would help. But in all honesty, let's say the Cavaliers are capable of pulling off all of the trades that are rumored for them. Let's say they got George Hill. Let's say they got Lou Williams from the Los Angeles Clippers. And let's say they got DeAndre Jordan from the Los Angeles Clippers. you got to give up something. But let's say all of that. They get steals. Just just dollar store fire sale from the Clippers. They bring all those players in. Jordan, Williams, Hill. They still don't beat the Warriors. That's the box canyon, the dead end, the cul-de-sac that the Cleveland Cavaliers have found themselves in. And apparently is led to the airing of grievances. This is, in a sense, festivus in the sports world. Remember Festivus from Seinfeld? The holiday created by George Costanza's family that involved both the airing of grievances and amazing feats of strength. Everyone is airing their grievances across the sports world. A few weeks ago, it was the New England Patriots apparently airing their grievances. Now, it includes, well, most of the NBA. Damian Lillard, Portland Trailblazers star point guard, is meeting with Paul Allen, the owner, to determine the organization's direction in future. John Wall and J.J. Barea. Washington Wizards John Wall and Dallas Mavericks J.J. Barea got into it. John Wall called J.J. Barea midget, right? A festivus for the rest of us! I got a lot of problems with you people! And John Wall is starting with J.J. Barea. Called him a midget, trying to get mad. Barea responded that, Wall, nobody likes you, including your own teammates. And Kawhi Leonard, my, you know, top five star in the NBA, Kawhi Leonard of the San Antonio Spurs. That relationship seems to be heading south. Here's Adrian Wojnarowski, ESPN NBA insider. There is a lot of stress on this organization right now based on how this has gone with Kawhi Leonard. There is, you know, the way it's been described to us in our reporting that he has become distant, disconnected from the group and he's, it's created Uh, The relationships need work there now. What is going on? First the Patriots, now the Spurs? We can count on nothing in life? Can we count on no models, no rocks, no foundations in life? Why would someone have trouble in San Antonio? Why would someone have trouble with Greg Popovich? Why would Kawhi Leonard not want to be there? Jalen Rose was on first take this morning, and he has some ideas. I hate to say this. Kawhi Leonard wants out of San Antonio. Is what I'm hearing. And the reason why is tenfold. One is they've been unable to attract elite level, all NBA caliber free agents to come play with him. Think about this. We always talk about players going to join large market teams. Who's going to L.A.? 
Who's going to New York? What's going on in Philly? We never say who's going to San Antonio to play with Kawhi. And here's why I think players have not done that. The Spurs way looks like opportunity dressed in overalls. It looks like work. And people really don't want that. Players talk about wanting to win and wanting to be a champion, but ultimately they want to do it on their own terms. And when you go to San Antonio, guess who's the CEO of that organization? Greg Popovich. It's going to be his way. I saw Jalen in the hallways. I'm buying one, I'm selling the other explanation. I'm not buying that San Antonio Spurs can't attract free agents. I'm not buying that San Antonio Spurs can't attract superstars. They just signed LaMarcus Aldridge two years ago. Now you can say it didn't work out in the beginning. Seems to be going pretty well this year. You can say it didn't turn out to be the super team they wanted it to be. But that year, Aldridge was the premier free agent on the market. Aldridge was who everybody wanted. And the Spurs got him. Now, as to Jalen's other explanation, that nobody wants hard work, I'm going to have to trust him on that. He says that's true. And that goes all the way to the top of the NBA. The biggest of superstars. They don't want to go and work like the way Popovich makes you work. Rather go to Houston. Antonio doesn't make you practice like that. That life's more fun. What's going on? What's with all of the... The tradition of Festivus begins with the airing of grievances. I got a lot of problems with you people. Now, you're going to hear about it. <laughs> what's going on? I'll tell you what I think is going on. Here's what's going on. This is the messy, jumpy, stop and start nature of innovation, honestly. This is how capitalism works. Somebody creates something and jumps way out in front of everybody else. They have a product that is far superior. That in the NBA is the Golden State Warriors. Their product is far superior to everyone else's on the market. And now every competitor is trying their darndest to catch up. That's going to cause failure. That's going to cause friction. That's going to cause falling out. It happens in dot-com startups, in Silicon Valley. It happens in the NBA. This is the nature of it. Everyone's trying to match and surpass what the Golden State Warriors has done. They're trying to create their own super teams. And on the long, along the path to that, they're going to kill relationships and kill short-term futures for franchises, kill starting lineups, kill trade scenarios. And that's okay. Damian Lillard's going to need to find a super team. It may not be in Portland. It may be somewhere else. Maybe it isn't going to end up being San Antonio for Kawhi Leonard. But this is the way it works. And hopefully, at the end, what we get is not fewer super teams, but more super teams. See, super teams aren't the problem in the NBA. The Golden State Warriors aren't the problem. The problem is we don't have enough of them. We need five of them. We need stars coalescing together. We don't want parity. We don't want all that talent scattered across the NBA. We don't want it to look like the NFL. Honestly, for your own individual fan base, you want to root for that. You hope that happens so that you have a shot. But the casual fan, casual fan doesn't care about your Cinderella story. Casual fan needs a brand they can tune into every year. Casual fan needs Warriors and Cavaliers. Four. Casual fan needs Cowboys, Packers, Patriots, Steelers. Casual fan needs brands that they recognize. In the NBA, that means super teams, superstars coming together. So hopefully, all this airing of grievances is going to lead to a few more super teams. I'd rather it not be the Houston... I'd rather it not be the Houston Rockets as a Dallas Mavericks fan. I'd rather it not be the Oklahoma City Thunder. But whatever it takes, there's going to have to be about four or five of those people. And by the way, I got some problems with you people as long as we're doing it. Nuno, you're new around here. You're not part of the team. You got to pick sides. Are you Stephen A or are you Will Kane? You're going to have to pick, pal. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sure. <laughs> Bubba, I need more laughter from you. I don't Excuse need just me. cutting barbs coming from you. Absolutely. And Saruti? What do you got? <laughs> I got nothing. You're doing a great job. Oh, right, no! The Will Kane Show is reminding you that if you're at work, you can stream all three hours of the show on ESPNRadio.com. You guys can air grievances if you want. Straight ahead. Right. Should the New York Giants be a little disappointed with their coaching hire? After all that buildup, after all that Nick Saban talk, that's what you got? What's wrong, New York? It's the Will Kane Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. One of the very few things I was wrong about. Was that Jim Harbaugh might be the next head coach of the New York Giants. Now, let me tell you something. I got a little bit of bad information on that. But there's a reason this information comes out. 
There's a reason this information bounces around. There's a reason that Jim Harbaugh's name is mentioned with every coaching vacancy that comes up in the NFL. Because he wants it to. It's the Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. The simple fact you're going to have to face, Michigan fans, because you're the ones that get so upset about this, Jim Harbaugh's name is mentioned when job openings come up because Jim Harbaugh's camp puts his name in the running. That's how this works. And then it filters around, and maybe it's there to create leverage, and maybe it's there to create fear with your current employer, or maybe it's there to keep you hot. John Gruden was really good at doing that for many, many years. His name was mentioned from everything from the University of Tennessee to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And ultimately, it landed on a $100 million contract with the Oakland Raiders. Keeping your name in the running, keeping your name in the mix, there's something like that going on right now, by the way, with who will take over for ESPN. Keeping your name involved creates the perception that you're in high demand. And you may be, or it may be perception, creating the reality. It's fake it till you make it. People do it all the time. And the reason they do it is because it works. Jim Harbaugh's name is out there because he helps put it out there. Now, that doesn't absolve me. I was wrong. I was wrong. And a lot of people were wrong on the New York Giants coaching search. Bruce Arians the former head coach of the Arizona Cardinals, was on the Colin Coward radio show. And Bruce Arians also speculated on who could be the next head coach of the New York Giants. It would not surprise me. You know, and, there, and there's a job he covets. It just happens to be open. And um, But he, he's got a dynasty right now, another dynamite recruiting class. Um, why he would do it, I don't know. But uh, it would not shock me if he did. What job? Uh, the Giants. Why the New York Giants? Because they're the New York Giants, and uh, you know when we grew up, they were, they were the they were the thing. That was Bruce Arians talking about Alabama Crimson Tide head coach Nick Saban. Now Nick Saban's name and the New York Giants have been connected for many years, and this is what I wonder: at the end of all of this, maybe Harbaugh was brought up in the offices in New York. Maybe Saban's name was brought up for the umpteenth time in the offices in New York or New Jersey for that matter. We know that Josh McDaniels, Patriots offensive coordinator, his name was brought up. We know that Matt Patricia's name, Patriots defensive coordinator's name was brought up. And you start thinking about it. The New York Giants have hired Pat Shermer, Minnesota Vikings offensive coordinator, as their head coach. Now, Pat Shermer may be awesome. Pat Shermer has worked wonders with Case Keenum. Pat Shermer created an offense in Minnesota that was legitimately good this entire season, working with their third-string quarterback. But Pat Shermer was not the New York Giants' first choice. Dismiss Harbaugh. Dismiss Saban. You can't dismiss McDaniels. You can't dismiss Patricia. By any estimation, the New York Giants did come down to about their third choice for head coach. And that got me wondering, how disappointed? Right or wrong? It's not fair, but we're not in the business of fair. We're in the business of is. How disappointed are New York Giants fans? And is Bruce Arians right? The New York Giants are a coveted job simply because they're the New York Giants. It sure didn't look like it this year. I don't don't believe that for a second. I get growing up. You know, the Giants, maybe they, maybe when there was less eyes on televisions, the Giants were like the biggest thing in the biggest market. I don't think markets matter anymore. I think situations matter. So I don't think there are necessarily, are, are there any jobs like that you, in pro sports? Because I get in college, like I get why you'd want to be the coach at Texas at football. I get why you'd want to be the head coach at Carolina or Duke basketball now. Uh, is there any professional job that you really think you need to take or that's so prestigious that you're like, I can't pass that up? Yes. I don't, really? Yes, I is believe Is the Giants that, that job? Yeah, I in think, a division with the Cowboys. God, I man, I can't strike out on McDaniel's. We know why they struck out on McDaniel's, by the way, because they gave Dave Gettleman the GM job, and McDaniel's wanted control over player personnel. So you almost have to give the Giants a pass on that one. Maybe Patricia was just good friends with the GM of the Detroit Lions, and that's why he wanted ended up there. But whatever the reasons or excuses are, the New York Giants brand wasn't enough to overcome it for those guys. It wasn't enough to overcome it for Patricia. It wasn't enough to overcome it for McDaniels. They did still land. Now, however, however you got there, they did still land on Shermer. But, Srudi, to answer your question, I do think the Giants are a prestigious job that will attract higher quality candidates than, say, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Like Ben McAdoo? 
<laughs> That's a good rebuttal. Just because they don't do it doesn't mean they can't. How about that? Just because they haven't hired high profile doesn't mean Will, they can't. Let me put it this way. So you you would take the Giants job over a job that might have better players and a more stable quarterback situation just because it's the Giants job? No, you forced me into a false choice. It's not whether or not I'd take <laughs> Andrew Luck or the Giants just because they're prestigious. I'm saying it's an extra scale on the weight, on the on the on the the balance of justice, you know, like a lady justice. But it's not even close scale. to the first thing you think of. Look, for some franchises, the Los Angeles Lakers, the Dallas Cowboys, the New York Yankees, the New York Giants. These are heavy weights on the scale that will attract bigger candidates. By the way, there are heavy weights on the other side of that scale. When it comes to the Dallas Cowboys, but, yeah, you get the prestige, you get the America's team, you get the star, you get the helmet, but you also have to put on the other side – Jerry Jones. But none of those jobs have prestigious head coaches. Like, look at the Lakers of Luke Walton. Like, I love Luke Walton, but it's not like he's he's not Pat Riley. Luke Walton. The Cowboys have your boy Jason Garrett, who, like, you can't get rid of fast enough, who has no name recognition whatsoever. Hold the on. The Yankees. Go ahead. Luke Walton was the hottest coaching prospect on the market that year. Luke Walton was the Sean, was it Sean McVay. He was bigger than Sean McVay. He was bigger than any coaching kid I can think of a parallel in NFL right now. He had te- he'd led the Warriors to some incredible unbeaten streak in Steve Kerr's absence. He had the number one team in the NBA. He got credit for it, and he was a Lakers legacy, both himself and his dad. He was high profile. Jason Garrett's because the other side of that balance, the other side of that scale, the Jerry Jones weight weighs very, very heavily. The Yankees <laughs> hired a broadcaster. <laughs> That's what he was famous, Bubba. The Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Drivers who switch to Progressive can save an average of $620. Straight ahead, why the Cavs have to trade LeBron? Because whose fault is it? Are you kidding me? Kevin Love and Isaiah Thomas? It's the Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio. This is the Will Cain Podcast on ESPN Radio. Woe says yesterday was Kevin Love Day. I think today must be Isaiah Thomas Day. The finger-pointing continues in Cleveland, and it's everybody's fault but LeBron's. How is it work that it's always Kevin Love's fault? How is he always the kick and dummy? How is Kevin Love always wrong? If Kevin Love is always wrong, get him out. Because as many times as the finger has been pointed at Kevin Love over the last couple of years, then you need to handle your business, Cleveland. You need to send him away. But if he's not the problem and you keep using him as your blame, your your punching bag, then Kevin Love needs to get out. Be done with it, Kevin. Why deal with that? It's the Will Kane Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Why deal with that, Kevin? You thought this airing of grievances where players accused Kevin Love of faking an illness during the game against the Oklahoma City Thunder. A game, by the way, where the Cleveland Cavaliers gave up 148 points. A game that former coach, roadkill, former punching bag, Dave Blatt, who's now coaching all-star games in Turkey, pointed out, might not have been their best defensive performance. I hope we don't give up as many points as the Cavaliers gave up last night. Yeah, well, you didn't. You didn't, I'm sure. It was a party for the Oklahoma City Thunder on Saturday night, and everybody got free shots. It was Stephen Adams with 25 points, Paul George with 36 points, Russ with 23 points and 20 assists, Carmelo over 25 points. And in the wake of that abysmal performance by the Cleveland Cavaliers, the finger-pointing started. As you heard Woj point out, Kevin Love, he's the target right now. That's something that we're going to keep, or we try to keep in house. I felt like we should keep it uh, on the court or in the locker room. Um, you know, obviously, it didn't stay there, but we just had a meeting. We aired any grievances we had, and you know we're going to move forward. Hopefully, we'll be better for it. We have been in the past, and you know we'll just uh, you know put that behind us now. And we've got to face a tough San Antonio team tonight, so we got to bring it on the road. I swear to you, if I'm Kevin, I'm done with this, man. I'm done. Let me ask you this: Do you think? If he could do it all over again, would he want to go to Cleveland four years ago, leaving Minnesota? Was it worth it? To get one, the title. one title. To go yeah. through all that, all that crap. He was the scapegoat every single year. He was always the problem. LeBron always like kind of like insinuating that he's the issue with the Cavs. How is that? It's, how is it that Kevin Love is the problem? He's not. Clearly. Now that doesn't mean he's perfect. Certainly not on the court. Kevin Love's a better player than the player he's been in Cleveland. He sacrificed his game 
He's kept his mouth shut. He's not aired dirty laundry. Kevin Love, while never a great defensive player, on another squad is, if not a 1, a 1A player in the box score. I don't know if that team goes to the championship, and I don't know that team how far they go in the playoffs. That's who he was before the Cavs, and that's who he could be for another team. But in Cleveland, he's the problem. In Cleveland, he's the scapegoat. In Cleveland, in meetings, he's the guy all the fingers are pointed at. Right, LeBron? I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. LeBron didn't want to talk about it. LeBron didn't want to talk about it. I said he didn't want to talk about it. Of course he didn't. (laughs) But as I said, Woj says yesterday was Kevin Love Day because today is Isaiah Thomas Day. Not only is it Kevin Love's fault what's going on in Cleveland, it's the new guy's fault as well. Oh, yeah, it's the guy who's always been here, Kevin Love. Yeah, it's always Kevin's fault. It's always Kevin's fault. But you know who else's fault it is? It's also the new guy, Isaiah Thomas. I know he just got here. But he's the guy. He's also the problem. Which one is this, Rudy? All the way over? Windhorst on Isaiah Thomas? Listen to Brian Windhorst last night on SC6 talking about, no, Isaiah Thomas is to blame. He's frustrating his teammates right now because he is a guy who has the ball in his hands a lot. He controls the ball. He dribbles the ball a lot. He doesn't pass the ball much. And when he's shooting 45% and averaging 30 points and not playing with other All-Stars like he did in Boston, that can work. Right now, he's really struggling, and it's getting on his teammates' nerves, especially him holding the ball. And quite frankly, you're right, they are worse on defense, but they're also worse on offense. If Isaiah was more himself, if he was the player he was before he got hurt and he was scoring, I don't think the Cavs players would be complaining as much. But right now, amongst themselves, internally in that locker room, Isaiah Thomas has caused some frustration, and that is something that Ty Lue and the team is going to have to evaluate as they decide on playing time going forward. Man, listen, I try to be objective and tell you the truth, regardless of where my personal feelings may lie. Everyone perceives that when you tell the truth, you actually have a hidden agenda. What you're doing is you're revealing your hatred, your animosity, your bias, your fandom when you do these things, when you tell the truth. Well, let's try to try to process this. We all know my biases. I'm pretty honest about them. That's the way you be truthful. You let people know your preconceived notions because we all have them. That's what I believe is the path to truth. So mine, you know, I'm a Cowboys homer. It's true. What do you want me to do? Go back to age six and not cry through the catch? You want me to not argue at age six that Dwight Clark had stick him on his hands? He did. When Joe Montana threw the pass over Ed Tutal Jones, Dwight Clark had stick him on his hands. Okay? Deal with it. You can't unprogram that kind of bias. I love the Cowboys. I always have to try to compensate for it. So Eagles fans, when I come at you and I can't give Nick Foles credit, you can compensate because you know, because I'm being honest with you, about my bias. But that bias isn't going to stop me from trying to seek the truth. I have said it's an embarrassment what's happening in Dallas, that somehow everybody that works for you is at fault. Not Jason Garrett, not the offensive coordinator Scott Linehan, not the defensive coordinator Rod Marinelli. No, 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 no. It's the position coaches. That's who's really at fault in Dallas. It's the wide receivers coach, the quarterback coach, the defensive back coach. Those are the guys that really got to get rid of and shake things up around here. What a joke. What a joke. Blame your underlings. Blame your employees that you hired. You're the one who brought them in. So if they're all failing you, you have failed. So don't Cleveland Cavaliers now tell me that the real problem is the guy we've always used as our scapegoat, the guy we've always used as our punching bag, and the new guy that we just got. It's Kevin Love and Isaiah Thomas' fault. They're flawed players, both defensively. And that adds up to some difficult basketball from time to time. But don't give me all this other stuff because you knew what you were getting. You made the trades. And if you want to deal with real correction, you want to deal with real blame, because real blame leads to solutions, then you have to look at the top. That's the way it is, okay? You want to put it on Colby Altman, the GM who traded for Isaiah Thomas and traded Kyrie away? You can do that. But you want to put it on LeBron James? LeBron James has brought all the wonderful things the Cleveland Cavaliers have experienced to their doorstep. But that does not a saint make someone. That does not perfection make. Just because you have doesn't mean you will always be blameless. And leadership is at the top, not at the bottom. You blame 
Isaiah and Kevin and call that leadership? No. No. That's not leadership. That isn't how it works. That's not going to solve your problems in Cleveland. You can tweet the show through the oneerinflowers.com Twitter feed at Will Kane Show. oneerinflowers.com always has something to surprise her. Right now, when you order a dozen multicolored roses for only twenty nine ninety nine, you'll get another dozen plus a vase absolutely free. To order, go to oneerinflowers.com slash ESPN. Here's the deal. I laid it out a little bit earlier. I'm going to lay it out again. 888-SAY-ESPN, 888-729-3776. You want the truth? You want an unbiased, no hatred, no emotion, no vested interest truth? You want light and purpose for the future? The Cavs and LeBron should part ways. The Cavs and LeBron should agree to a trade. Next on The Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Insanity is an inability to recognize reality. If you don't like that one, try this one on. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. It's The Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Are the Cleveland Cavaliers insane? I hope not. Because let me tell you something. It is not a hot take. It is not bananas. It is not crazy, nonsensical trade machine games to say, you know what the real path forward for the Cleveland Cavaliers is? It's to talk LeBron James into a trade. It's to waive his no trade clause and look at trading the last five months of LeBron James. Here's why. First of all, let's start with recognizing reality. Number one, the reality is you're not going to beat the Golden State Warriors. We all know it. I know it. You know it. The Cleveland Cavaliers know it. There's no trade that doesn't involve LeBron James that's going to change that fact of life. You could trade for DeAndre Jordan, Lou Williams, and George Hill. And you're not going to beat the Golden State Warriors. So recognize that reality. This is not normal. Don't wave your hand at what's going on in Cleveland. The worst defense in the NBA. Finger pointing in the locker room. Blaming it on Isaiah Thomas, who just got there. Blaming it on Kevin Love, like you always do. Nothing about that is normal. Don't tell me this is what the Cavaliers do every year. The reality is... You're in a horrendous situation, there's no way to get better, and you're going to lose to the Cavs again, I'm sorry, lose to the Warriors again, best case scenario. Secondarily, don't do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. We know the outcome, you will lose to the Warriors. So what's the, what's the path that both helps the city of Cleveland, the franchise of the Cleveland Cavaliers, and LeBron James as an individual? It's the part ways, man. LeBron's in a mess, a no-win, no-title mess. Cleveland has no path forward, no trade assets to bring anything real back. They have to look at a future that doesn't include LeBron because we know he already is considering that future. He won't commit to them. How do you stay in a relationship with somebody who says, we'll see? Will you be married to me next year? We'll see. How about next month? We'll see. Hard to plan around that person's commitment to you. So, you trade the last five months of LeBron for some semblance of a future, some semblance of purpose. Young player. I don't think you can get a good draft pick back with five months of LeBron because the kind of teams that want LeBron will be Houston, San Antonio maybe, teams with draft picks late in the 20s of the first round. I don't know what that's going to get you, Cleveland, but you got to start considering this. you got to set emotion aside because it's the future that makes sense for all parties. Will from Arizona. Will, you're on the yeah. Will Kane show. What's up, man? Yeah, hi, Will. Thanks for taking my call. Really appreciate listening to you and all on all platforms. Thanks, um, man. Have enjoyed the the talk today about uh, all the avenues for the Cleveland trade uh, potential uh, to cure their problems and the Bronze and and Cleveland's. What do you think should um, happen? Well. I, I just I want your thoughts on realistic scenarios on if that trade could actually be pulled off. One, I think LeBron might have too much pride and desire to control the narrative like he always does and rather just ride out the storm for five more months. And well, hold it right there play. for a second, Will. Hold it right there. Don't you think that it's an easier exit for LeBron to say, well, Cleveland didn't want me. The Cavs didn't want me. This was a mutual parting of the ways, as opposed to the end of the season, walk away from the contract, walk away from the franchise a second time. Which one is really rougher on his legacy? Absolutely, and I totally agree with that. But that brings me to my second point, that would potential suitors 
that LeBron would be willing to go to actually be willing to take him. I know that sounds crazy. He's the best player arguably ever to play the game. But given that potential suitors he would want to go to, i.e. those top seeds in the West, I would think, wouldn't want to take him on because they're already close to competing with the Warriors, the Rockets, uh, the Spurs if Kawhi's healthy, uh, potentially OKC if they pull thing, continue to pull things together. So I just wonder if that would actually be able to play out um, given, given those scenarios. I got it, Will. Thanks for the call, man. I appreciate it. Good handle you got there. Um, the only team that I feel comfortable saying is okay rolling the dice out onto the craps table with their current lineup against the Warriors is the Rockets. The Spurs and the Thunder would I – mean, well, first of all, let's just back up. Everybody would like to have LeBron. The question is who would give up something of consequence for LeBron. And if the Rockets had to give up something serious, they're the ones that, they're the only ones that you could go, hmm, let's think about it. Everybody else has to do that deal because you're not beating the Warriors as it is anyway. The hard part is I don't know how to put value on five months LeBron. I have no idea what that's worth. The Cavs have to find out if it's something they can build around for the future. Stacy in Georgia. What's up, Stacy? Hey, man, what's going on? Appreciate the call. Taking my call. Um, my question is, I know this is all hypothetical. I mean, we can do it to death. Yeah, but it shouldn't be. Say, go ahead. Say the trade goes down. Say LeBron does go to the Rockets. And the Cavs get a couple pieces in return. And they both make the playoffs. Maybe Cleveland makes it as a six or a seven seed, depending on the lot of factors. But just say that the Cavs make it past the first round, competitive in the second round. What does that say to LeBron's legacy as far as, you know, hey, we, we were still just a couple pieces away uh, from getting to where we want to be without you? Does that All make sense? Right. Yeah, I got it, Stacey. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. You know, I, it's funny. I think sometimes I'm pegged as like a LeBron hater because we like to live in categories, right? That's We can only see things in like – cartoonish caricature versions of human beings. And like this guy, there's a famous one or two are LeBron haters, right? And if you have any criticism for LeBron, you're, you're, you're put into that category, which is asinine. Okay. Because I think the way the world works is you got a LeBron, a lot of LeBron worshipers, which means he can do no wrong. He's a quasi religious figure that thou shalt not ever question. And my thing is like, if you at all question LeBron, you become shoved into the other cartoon character of Hater. LeBron's legacy is safe. If the Cavaliers advance to the Eastern Conference Finals without LeBron, that might hurt a little bit, but LeBron's legacy is safe. He's taken them, what is it, to seven straight NBA Finals. He's phenomenal. But when I say his legacy is set, he's not passing Jordan. I don't think there's going to be much left in his career that's going to bolster his argument over Jordan. But I'm not going to take it down a couple notches either. Even though I say Kevin Durant is the race car passing him as we speak, that's not taking LeBron down. That's recognizing where we are at this stage of his career, the reality that we're in right now. By the way, you want to know what's happening right now with LeBron James? I'll let you know. I'll read it. Can I get a little music, Bubba? This is a letter from King James to a young James, young LeBron, posted on Instagram today. King James, I want to be one of the first to congratulate you on this accomplishment, this achievement tonight that you'll reach. Only a handful has reached or seen it too. And while I know it's never been goal of yours from the beginning, try, please try to take a moment for yourself and how you've done it. Again, if you're just not joining us, this is LeBron James writing a letter to LeBron James. The house you're about to be a part of has only six seats in it as of now, but one more will be added and you should be very proud and honored to be invited inside. There's so many people to thank who has helped this even become possible. So thank all, thank them all. And when you finally get your moment alone, to yourself, smile. Look up. Look up to the higher skies and say, thank you. So with that said, congrats again, young king. One love. Hashtag strive for greatness, rocket ship. Hashtag kid from Akron crown LeBron James to LeBron James. Just a little light reading for you. If you want to go on Instagram and see LeBron 
prematurely congratulate himself on 30,000 points tonight. Healthy ego. Just just strong, healthy ego. A lot of Stuart Smalley listening in there. It's the Will Kane Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Um, Hey, guys, if I ask Sal Pal about our proposed hypothetical Browns-Eagles trade, will he get mad? There's a pretty good chance, and I think we're rooting for it in the control room. So if I ask him, would the Eagles trade Carson Wentz for the first and fourth pick from the Browns, he'll explode on me? I, I hope so. Is he top five in our fear rankings along with Teddy Bruschi? He's sneaky up there. Top five might be a bit much. Sal's a nice guy, but he, yeah, I think he's sneaky up there. He might be just under Jeff Van Gundy. Yes. He's not as scary as Jeff Van Gundy. Let's try it straight ahead. Sal Palantonio and my hypothetical trade. It's the Will Kane Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. We've talked about this, Nuno. You do it on the show. You got it? Nuno's new to our show. We stole him from the Stephen A. Smith show. I'm stealing everything from Stephen A. Smith. I'm soon to snatch the life from him. I got his his debates on first take. I'm getting him on the radio, and I took Nuno from the Stephen A. Smith show's staff. Because as you guys know, Michelle Smallman left us a few weeks ago, and now Nuno's part of our family. But you do it on the show, Nuno. I just didn't want to let you know that David Blatt's team gave up 151. Because <laughs> I said this, David Blatt with the side shot at LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers. When was this? Last night? Sunday night? Sometime after Saturday night, after the Cavaliers gave up 148 to the Oklahoma City Thunder. Here's Dave Blatt somewhere in Turkey. I hope we don't give up as many points as the Cavaliers gave up last night. But they did, is what you're here to tell me, Nuno. They did. His Team Europe gave up 151 points to Team Asia. So, backfired on Dave Blatt. So, we've got this rankings going, internal ESPN intimidation rankings. And I think they go something like this right now. Who is most intimidating to interview? Who is most intimidating to come across? Number one, with a bullet, Teddy Bruschi. Without a doubt. Not even close. Not even close. Number two, Stan, or Stan, Jeff Van Gundy. Stan, by the way, is the opposite of that. Not intimidating. Jeff got all the intimidation genetics. Stan got none of the intimidation genetics. Whatever happened in that household, they raised Jeff to be intimidating and Stan to be friendly. I'm not saying Jeff's not friendly. Just intimidating. Bill Polian, three. Stephen A. Smith, four. And you think, Rosilla, you think, Sruti Rosillo is five. Yeah. I think lurking on the outside is Sal Palantonio on the Shell Pinzo performance line. Sneaky intimidating, Sal. Sneaky. <laughs> See, that's why right there. <laughs> right there. Yes. You don't know what you're going to get. <laughs> Suffers no fools. <laughs> what do you got, Will? What's up? Here's what I got. What happened? Come on. Who saw that coming? Who saw that coming from Nick Foles? No one saw that. Well, Nick Foles played extremely good football four years ago, so I, I know he ago. was fully. I, I, I know he was fully capable physically for to do it. But you got to remember something: a, the guy had no preseason because he had a bad arm. B, he watched Carson Wentz run away with America, and then C, he's handed the keys to the car in first place and told, "Don't crash it." So then he finally gets a couple of weeks of practice under his belt. And, you know, the coaching staff put in a very good game plan. And two weeks in a a row, they changed the game plan from short, quick throws to let's let's play Daryl LaMonica to Warren Wells. And uh, I I tell you, it's been an astonishing transformation to watch it. Yeah. The The thing about Nick Foles is this. You're not going to rattle this guy. You're just not going to. He's a very cool customer. I've known him his entire career. He's got uh, he's got a great upbringing, a great upbringing. He's got great football DNA from Texas. You know, he was a Texas high school schoolboy, old state basketball player. Austin so Wesley. You know, yeah, you know he's got athletic skill because there's a lot of basketball players in the state of Texas and a lot of football players. So you know he's got athletic skill, and you know he's competed at the highest level possible. So now he's starting to emerge. <clears throat> and man, oh man, they had a great game plan. 
But be honest, Sal, when Carson Wentz went down, you thought the season was over, right? I did not. Oh, man. You're smarter than I am. I did not. Well, you know, that's because, hey, man. Go ahead. I'm around the team. I'm around <laughs> the team. I, I know I know what this team is about. It's a different team. They got a lot of guys on that team. Chris Long, LeGarrette Blunt, Malcolm Jenkins, Zach Gertz, Brent Selleck, Fletcher Cox, Timmy Jernigan. Tory Smith, go down the list. A lot of guys who are hungry and uh, want to get a Super Bowl title. And, oh, by the way, they have a great coaching staff. That's a fact. I mean, a great. I mean, Jim Schwartz is not getting enough credit. This is a guy who's got an economics degree from Georgetown. He's a smart. This, you know, remember, when he walks in the room, he's the only guy who got 1700 on his SATs, okay? We, he's a smart he guy. Well, I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't know exactly what the number is, <laughs> but but if you're going into the economics program at Georgetown, you're probably somewhere around sixteen fifty, maybe seventeen hundred, right? I mean, come on. Are you an Eagles I'm state, fan? I, I'm a state school guy. I went to Oneonta State. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> I got a lot of respect for that guy. I am not an Eagles fan. I grew up in New York City, like Stephen A. Stephen A. and I grew basically from the same part of the country, Queens, New York. I just saw you putting that jacket on Jimmy Johnson this weekend, and I was starting to wonder, Sal, who it is you pulled No, You know, I, I, I was playing along with my friend Ron Jaworski. We were having <laughs> fun in front of the Eagles fans. It hurt you know, a I grew, I actually I actually grew up a Joe Willie Namath fan. I like the Packers. My dad loved Lombardi. We had three photographs in the house, the Pope, JFK, and Vince Lombardi. Nice. Okay. Which one was the highest on the wall? No, the one that was centered just above the other two was Lombardi, yeah. Oh, no, no, you did it above the Pope. That's, you, can't, you, can't, you can't do that. Football, football was big in my house. All right, let's see if this makes you mad, okay? Okay, go ahead, baby, what do you got? All right, if the Cleveland Browns called Philadelphia and said, I'll give you, the one overall and four I'll all. Give you Lake, I'll give you Lake Erie for Carson Wentz. <laughs> yes, yes, that's it. I'll give you Lake Erie. Who for hangs Car- up? You get all- Who hangs up? <laughs> I give you Lake Erie for Carson Wentz. <laughs> and, and Philly hangs up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I think I got the answer. I think I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see how far the Nick Foles mania went. I just want to see how far, and I'm not saying you're part of it. Trust me. I've got a radio show here now. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> yeah, I see that. I hear that. <laughs> and, you know, I see you on the show with Stephen A. and Max all the time. You do a great job. I mean, I wouldn't agree to come on your show if I didn't think you were doing a good nah. job. I think you do a great job. Thank you, Sal. But, I'm a fan. But don't, but, don't, but don't you live in, like, Dallas? I'm from Dallas, and that's why it hurt uh, well, me to watch you and Jaworski. Uh, explain the questions. That that's <laughs> well, I that's why it hurt me to watch you and Jaworski put it. It hurt me more that Jimmy Johnson didn't throw that Philadelphia Eagles jacket off the minute you put on him. It sat on his shoulders. I counted the seconds, and it approached 10 before I think he turned to Jaworski and said, get it off. <laughs> Jimmy Johnson was saying during the entire time, y'all are going to get me in trouble. And... Uh, <laughs> But he also knew that the only way he was getting out of that stadium at that point was putting the jacket on. <laughs> no, that's true. I didn't think about that. All right, yeah, Sal. You should think about that. Well, listen, I'd love to have you on the show listen, sometime. When, when, when it, yeah, I'm on anytime you want, brother. What were you going to ask you do him? A good job. I like, I, like, I like what you do. Keep doing what you do. And, you know, Stephen A is my guy, so mm-hmm. take care of him. You Queens guys hang together. I'm now an Upper West Side guy, so no Dallas for me anymore. So. <laughs> Thanks for having me on your program. All right, that's Sal Palantonio, ESPN NFL reporter. Appreciate it. The Will Cain Show is presented by Progressive Insurance. All right, listen, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but Alex Rodriguez is on the biggest redemption arc, of least of recent memory, but, like, this might be coming all-time status. He's now a colleague of mine. The Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Alex Rodriguez on the biggest redemption arc in, I don't know, at least the last six months. It's the Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. I was right. Right, folks? Sal Palantonio belongs in the top five. He lived up to the hype. From the from the first thing that he said, which wasn't even words, it was just like, <laughs> <laughs> It was a uncomfortable And then laugh. he was like, what do you got for me, Will? <laughs> he didn't want to play around at all. Hey, the key to intimidating someone 
is unpredictability. The key is to not know what the next moment holds. That's Sal's genius on this. I have no idea. Will he get mad at me? Will he laugh? Will he play ball? Will he tell me it's idiotic? That's the key. When Teddy Bruschi looks at you, you don't have any idea. Is he going to tackle me right in my sternum? Or will he answer the question? I'm just not sure by the look in his eye. That's the key to being intimidating. Leaving people with no idea what you're going to do next. I was saying, and Sal nailed it because that was, and it was great, but it was seven minutes and I was, I think everyone in the control room was uncomfortable because we didn't know where that was going to go. We didn't know, <laughs> first off, I didn't know if he liked you. And then he, and when we found out when he did like you, we were like, okay, it's, it's, it's sort of settled at this point. But it was up in the air there for a good four minutes in a great way. Yeah. Van Gundy's got that mastered too. That's the exact same quality that Van Gundy has. No idea which question is going to set him off. The Will Cain Show is reminding you if you miss any of the show, including when I asked Brian Windhorst if the Cavs should trade LeBron in hour two, every hour is available on the Listen tab of the ESPN app. Also, go to iTunes, download the podcast, subscribe, rate, and review, because that's apparently how everything is done. Give it some stars. Let the world know what you think. Go do that. Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio, please. Um, so what? help me break this news. We didn't break it. Who broke it? The sporting news? Sporting news this morning broke the story that later ESPN confirmed that A-Rod will be the new Sunday night baseball analyst. Alex Rodriguez joining ESPN, but not leaving Fox, right? Still going to do the postseason work with Fox, which is an incredible deal. I mean, and and it just got us thinking, like, this guy, he's gone from, we, we couldn't get rid of him fast enough. Nobody wanted to see his face when he was with the Yankees after he got suspended for a year and refused to go away and came back, even though the Yankees didn't want him and the fans didn't want him. To now, like he's everybody loves him. He's like the best analyst in baseball. Yeah, A Rod's gone from universally hated to almost universally loved in record amount of time. Now it's interesting what happens the minute you get yourself in front of the media on a consistent basis of what that reveals about how people feel about you. I don't think anybody, particularly outside of Boston, loved or hated Paul Pierce before he started doing this. But I'll tell you, I'll bet you Paul Pierce is on a upward trajectory of being loved by the public because of who he is on NBA Countdown. A-Rod has been really good. He's been really good as a baseball analyst. And all of a sudden, nobody cares that he was busted for PEDs. That what are his lowest hits? That he lied? That he was a diva in general? Well, he lied like a million times about taking PEDs. He lied two separate times. Um, he was obviously suspended, like I said, for a whole season. <laughs> and then at the end, he wouldn't go away. He wouldn't leave. <laughs> he loved baseball, man. Just want to keep playing baseball. Like he, he's trying to sue the the baseball uh, union, like he was going to do that. So there's all of that. And who would have thought that all these years that A Rod is loved and Derek Jeter is hated in baseball? <laughs> that's so that's so good, Nuno. <laughs> who would have projected that? Derek Jeter hated in the media. A Rod loved in the media. Think about the career redemption. Think about the redemption arc of A Rod. It starts to rival. What's the biggest? What's the biggest redemption story? Kobe. Kobe's up there. Kobe is a sainted figure today. Thou shalt not speak ill of Kobe. My man was charged. Yes, went to trial. Did not dropped settled for rape in Colorado. What a redemption story for Kobe. I mean, if that's what we're calling it, redemption or amnesia. Who else we got? I, where's, I had a list of these guys. You think OJ's on some kind of arc, Saruti? You think well, OJ is on a redemption arc? I think that I think the popularity of the of the documentary and then the TV show. I think people are fascinated by him again, and are sort of, and, and like he's going to start getting deals, and and he's going to start being on television, and he's going to be in the public a bit more. Yeah, but famous and fascinated by are not the same thing as cheering for, applauding. Yeah, but and once you, once you see him on once you see him in, in these public places, and he becomes more human like to you, and you kind of relate to him a little bit more. That's how it works. Like look at what happened with A Rod. He started dating J Lo, and all of a sudden it's like oh, okay, this guy's kind of normal, and he's he's cool, and he's. He's hanging out with the barstool guys. Like it's a, it's an image that's basically like been completely redone. So I don't think that's ridiculous that it would happen with OJ. Speaking of rape, by the way, Mike Tyson, huge redemption story. How much did the Hangover have to do with that? It was already before the Hangover, right? I don't know. I think that was the younger generation. That was hilarious. 
Roethlisberger? I don't. I don't. I still think people don't like him for 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 more than the reasons of what happened years ago in that bathroom. Think about the guys that don't get the redemption stories. T.O. T.O. is going to be on our show next week. T.O. on the Will Cain show. Barry Bonds. It's yeah, like he, was, he was off. He was he was uh, he was a bad guy to the media. So of course. He, it's, he's never going to be able to overcome that. Yeah, but that's the nonsense. A Rod, by the way, might have been a jerk. A Rod might have been a diva. A Rod might might have lied. But the the one thing you can't do is be a jerk to the media. The one thing you can't do is have a bad personality. Apparently, it's like like Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman. All you got to do in life is be well liked. I mean, it, it's it's been redemptive for A Rod, redemptive for Kobe, for Mike Tyson. I don't know. It hasn't worked for OJ. Hasn't worked for Barry Bonds. Hasn't worked for T.O. Just got to work on being well, more well-liked. It's the Will Cain Show on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Coming up, straight ahead, Spain and Fitz next.